Greetings. Thank you for tuning in to this virtual presentation today. My name is Mark Ballum, and I will be telling you about the work that I did on Bigels. This research was conducted in the Department of Food Science and Human Nutrition at Iowa State University. Bigel may be a new term for many of you, and this makes sense because the first publication mentioning one only came out in 2008, about 12 years ago. A bigel is a biphasic system, meaning it has two phases. What differentiates it from other biphasic systems, such as an emulsion, is the fact that both of its phases are structured. Your structured oil phase is called an organogel, or oleogel if edible, and your structured water phase is called a hydrogel. Together, these can be homogenized to make a bigel. A bigel has great diversity in how it can be synthesized. Because you have two phases, you can use a wide array of different gelators. You can modify your homogenization speed, your homogenization time, the temperature at which you homogenize the phases, as well as the gelation status of your phases. Both phases can be already gelled when you homogenize, or they can be ungelled, or you can have one that's gelled and one that's ungelled. Now that you know what a biogel is, you might be wondering, why should you use one? To answer this, it's helpful to think about where a bigel has already been used in the literature. It has been able to successfully deliver drugs, and so that caught our attention because we're thinking if you can deliver drugs with them, why not use them to deliver bioactives in food? Another advantage of using a bigel is that you can increase the protein content of your food, which is on trend. To do this, you simply need to use a protein as one of your gelators. Also, a bigel is going to be semi-solid, which is advantageous. As I discussed in the previous slide, there are many ways to manipulate the final characteristics of a bigel to meet your various applications. And finally, with a bigel, you get the advantage of having both aqueous and organic phases, meaning you can carry both hydrophilic and lipophilic drugs. We saw an opportunity in the food industry for bigels, and that's where this work stemmed from. Specifically, we wanted to develop and characterize a novel edible bigel system that had potential to protect sensitive food ingredients, such as probiotics. So how did we make our gels? Our organic phase was in fact an oleogel emulsion. It was an emulsion because it contained a significant amount of water. The oil phase was developed previously in our lab by Gaudino et al. It was composed of soybean oil, soy lecithin, stearic acid, and water. Soy lecithin and stearic acid served as our organogelators and were used at a ratio of 7 to 3, respectively. We used two water usage levels, 10 and 20 percent. Our hydrogel phase was made from whey protein concentrate 80 and water. We used two whey protein levels, 15 and 25 percent and we homogenized our phases at a high shear for a high time to make a bigel. The nomenclature shown here on the right is what I'll use for the remainder of this presentation. So the ratios of phases are oleogel emulsion to hydrogel. So 0, 10 is 0 parts oleogel to 10 parts hydrogel, 3, 7 would be 3 parts oleogel to 7 parts hydrogel, and so forth. We used three main methods to characterize our gels. On the nano level, we use small angle x-ray scattering. On the micro level, we used fluorescence microscopy. And on the macro level, we used rheology. We were able to successfully make bigels. Shown here on the slide are images of some of the gels. These images were not inverted on the computer. Rather, we took the images like this to highlight that the gels are able to support their own weight. All the way on the left, we have the pure hydrogel, so that's zero parts oleogel to 10 parts hydrogel, with increasing oil content as you go right, with the pure oleogel all the way on the right. What I hope you'll observe is that the bigels in the middle, so the 3, 7, 5, 5, and 7, 3, are smooth and homogenous appearing. No separation occurred for at least six months. Shown here on this slide were the gels that were made at 15% protein in the hydrogel and 10% water in the oleogel. However, the gels that were made at the other water content and protein content looked fairly similar, and so representative images are just shown here on the slide. 
We were able to collect quite a few curves on our X-ray scattering instrument. However, many of the curves show similar findings, so we're going to just zoom in on one of them. We have our Q value on the x-axis and the signal on the y. We have our pure oleogel all the way on the top with the pure hydrogel on the bottom. We know from previous work in our lab that soilecithin makes a reverse micelle with a diameter of about 50 angstroms. We were curious, does the addition of hydrogel permit, prevent, or modify the formation of this micelle? More or less what we observe, regardless of our hydrogel content in the gels with any oleogel phase present, we see a peak at about 50 angstroms. What this allows us to conclude is that despite hydrogel addition, our reverse micelles made from soylecithin are still able to form. Looking at our stearic acid next, we know that it makes bilayers that are about 40 angstroms. So similar to soylecithin, we wanted to know if the addition of hydrogel permitted prevented or modified their formation. More or less what we observe is a peak at 40 angstroms without any shifting, regardless of hydrogel content. So similar to soylecithin, this allows us to conclude that our addition of hydrogel does not modify the formation of the stearic acid bilayers. Interestingly, in the gels with more oleogel phase present, we see some peaks here at lower Q values or higher D values. We hypothesize that this is higher order structuring such as hexagonal or cubic mesophases of the soylecithin reverse micelles. It is interesting that we only observe them in the gels with more oleogel phase present. There are two possible reasons for this. First, either as the hydrogel content increases, these particular structures are getting diluted out, or second, as hydrogel content increases, these particular structures are not being allowed to form. We hypothesize that it is the latter of these two hypotheses because we are still able to observe the soylecithin reverse micelle peak at the higher hydrogel containing gels. So if the mesophase structures were still present, we would likely observe them. So we hypothesize here that the hydrogel is still permitting the basic structural units of the oleogel to form, but it's not permitting any long range interactions. Moving into our macro structure, we conducted rheology to assess this. Specifically, we began with an amplitude sweep. Many of the curves we collected look similar, so we are going to just zoom in on two of them. We have our strain on the x-axis and storage modulus on the y. On the left, we have our gels at 15% protein, 10% water, and on the right, we have our gels at 15% protein, 20% water. Our loss modulus data is not shown. However, our storage modulus was greater than the loss modulus, indicating solid-like behavior. This affirms the images of the gels that I showed you two slides ago. Furthermore, our pure oleogel had quite a low critical strain, whereas the gels with more hydrogel phase present at a higher critical strain. As hydrogel content increased, the length of our linear viscoelastic region likewise increased. This is a major advantage of using a bi-gel over a pure oleogel because the structure is not as shear sensitive. As I mentioned, on the left, we have the gels at 10% water and on the right at 20% water. I wanna draw your attention to the pure oleogel. At 10% water, its storage modulus is a little bit over 10,000 pascals, whereas at 20% water, its storage modulus is approaching 100,000 pascals. This might be rather interesting and the opposite of what you'd expect because as water content is increasing, you wouldn't think that the G prime would increase. However, after looking at the literature, this affirms findings of, of other studies that have found that there is likely a synergy between soylecithin, stearic acid, and water. They're all essential partners in gelation. That's not to say that you can just keep increasing the water content and expect to keep getting a firmer and firmer gel. In fact, eventually the effect will taper off. However, more work is needed to find what that exact water content is. Final thing to point out here is the 7-3, so seven parts oleogel, three parts hydrogel. At 15% protein, 10% water, it has the highest G prime. However, at 20% water, it's now in the middle of the pack.
This is rather interesting, and it suggests that at certain protein levels, certain water levels, you can get a synergy between the ratios of the phases, and you can get a greater or stronger gel. Future work is needed to understand exactly how the phases are interacting in this type of gel, but nevertheless, this is an interesting finding. Finally, just to foreshadow something that will come up later in the presentation, I want to draw your attention to the 5-5. Five five. It has the lowest G prime, so the equal ratios of each phases. It was the weakest regardless of what the protein level was and regardless of what the water content is. I'll explain why that is when I get to the microscopy results. We also conducted frequency sweeps on the rheometer. We have frequency on the x-axis and storage modulus on the y. What I hope you can observe is that regardless of protein content, water content, or ratio of phases, each of our gels has a slight frequency dependence. This is indicative of a weak gel network structure. That's not exactly what we were going for because we were trying to create a bi-gel that was able to protect sensitive food ingredients. One possible way to get around this is to use a cold set whey protein gel. Currently, as we have it, our whey gel is already set at the time of homogenization due to its thermal treatment. If we use a cold set gel, we could get simultaneous gelation of both of our phases. Future research should look into this. The final test on the rheometer that we conducted was the temperature sweep. Similar to the other tests, many of the curves look similar, so we are going to just zoom in on one of them. We began our tests at 98 degrees Celsius, so that's why our x-axis starts at 98, and we ran the test until 8 degrees Celsius, so that's why we go from high to low on the x-axis. We have our storage modulus on the y. Generally, at low temperatures, our G prime was higher than at high temperatures where G prime was lower. This suggests that our storage modulus is temperature dependent. However, Regardless of temperature, our storage modulus was always greater than our loss modulus. This is likely due to our hydrogel, which if you recall is made from whey protein, and a thermally set whey protein gel is going to be thermally irreversible. Final interesting thing to point out from our temperature sweeps is this sharp inflection upwards that we observed in G prime around 30 degrees Celsius. This was most apparent in the gels with more oleogel phase present. We hypothesize that it is the stearic acid crystallizing. However, you don't observe it in the gels with less oleogel phase present because the stearic acid is more diluted. Next, we did microscopy to visualize how our phases were interacting. We used Nile Red for our fat phase and FITSI for the protein. We have colored the protein green and the fat red. This has a similar layout to a few slides ago with our pure hydrogel all the way on the left with increasing oil content as you go right to the pure oleogel all the way on the right. To begin, I'll show you the 3-7. In the 3-7, what I hope you'll observe is that the fat or the red specks are dispersed throughout the aqueous phase. So this is oil and water. Similar to emulsions, bigels can be classified as oil and water or water and oil. However, dissimilar to emulsions, a bigel can be bicontinuous. And that's what you observe here in the 5-5 is an equal distribution of both phases. If you recall from the amplitude sweep, I mentioned that the 5-5 had the lowest G prime regardless of protein or water content. Looking at this image, we can likely explain those findings. I hypothesize that because there is not a continuous dominant phase, you have a lower G prime than is possible in the systems where one of the particular phases, whether it be the oleogel or hydrogel, is the continuous and dominant phase. In conclusion, we were able to successfully make bi-gels with edible ingredients. Additionally, we found that our gels were stable for long periods of time and had solid-like behavior. We found that despite hydrogel addition, our oleogel retained its key basic structural units, that of the soylecithin reverse micelle and stearic acid bilayer, but lost potential long-range interactions. We found that at certain ratios of phases, water contents, and protein contents, a bi-gel can have improved mechanical properties. We found that as hydrogel content increased, our bi-gel had an increased critical strain, and this is a major advantage of using a bi-gel over a pure oleogel. Finally, we were able to observe the continuity or discontinuity of phases using microscopy.
Research is not possible without the generous support of others. We would like to thank our funding agencies and ingredient donor for their support. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to email any of the people listed on this screen. Thank you for your attention to this seminar.